chapter 12. Choir, thank you so very much. What a, what a reflective testimony of the greatness of God. As we celebrate our choir and our music ministry, we have the opportunity in just a couple of weeks to celebrate our music minister. We have a, such a privilege, folks. For 22 plus years, David Baker has been our associate pastor of worship. He has served faithfully. He has ministered to us in more ways than can possibly be tallied. And we want to be able to take care of him, let him know of our great love for him. In front of you is a love offering envelope. If you would consider a love gift to David and his family as they continue on in the ministry that God has called them to, I encourage you to do so. We'll be taking that up through the month as we uh, come to the day of a celebration of praise. That last Sunday in August is going to be a great day as we see music ministry uh, like we've never seen it before. It's going to minister to our hearts and our lives in, in such great ways. I hope you'll be able to be a part of that. And If you are part of the music ministry, Ministry, been in the music ministry, I encourage you, join me in part of being part of that choir as we sing and as we share praises to our Lord. It is going to be a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us folks. David, we love you and we thank you so very much. There's a book written a long, long time ago by a guy named John Milton Gregory, a book, uh, an educator's book. It's called The Seven Laws of Teaching. And it talks about the different elements of what it is to be able to have that moment when something that, uh, that the student did not know now suddenly knows, how all of that comes about. And one of the things that he says in that is that there is this thing called the lesson. And the lesson has to begin with things that the student can understand, and then truths are built upon that to bring them to a new revelation, a new understanding, a greater, a deeper understanding of whatever truth it might be that they are exploring. Jesus was a master at that. Jesus was the great educator in that regard because he used these things called parables. He used these things that were of everyday object, everyday events, everyday relationships. And Jesus took these relationships, these things, and he used them to show a truth. And then he applied that truth to our greater relationship with God. It might be about a shepherd looking for a lost sheep. It might very well be about a, uh, a lost son that comes home. It could be any number of things from their, their understanding of how a seed grows in, in fertile soil. Over and over and over again, Jesus uses this idea of parable to teach the great truth of the kingdom of God. And Mark is, records those so faithfully. Jesus is now in Jerusalem. Jesus is just beginning to, uh, to interact with the Pharisees of that city and to, uh, to run afoul of their, their favor, certainly. And in the process, Jesus has a lesson. He has that lesson for the disciples and a lesson that he's going to teach to the multitudes. But oh my goodness, he has a lesson for the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, can we just say, are unwilling students. They don't like what he has to say. They don't want what he has to say. What he says is disruptive. What he says is challenging and rebellious. And in the end, we know where the path leads. Well, Jesus has a lesson today because in the midst of teaching all of them, down 2,000 years later, the words of Jesus still have a lesson for us. So let's just go ahead and look in Mark chapter 12 and listen to this parable, this teaching of something that is known to show an even greater truth. Would you stand with me? Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. And he began to speak to them in parables, 
A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and they beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They'll respect my son, but these tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He'll come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to the others. Have you not read this scripture The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Thank you. You may be seated. The people knew what Jesus was talking about. They knew about this thing of sharecropping, what we would call it today. The idea that there is an owner of the land and he decides to set things up. He decides to go ahead and get everything together. He puts some people there to be able to tend it. They usually have some kind of arrangement worked out, something with a share of the crops or some such thing. It was very common. It had been going on for a very long time. It's even part of our economic culture today. And Jesus took that principle and he plays kind of a ridiculous what if with it. What if those sharecroppers, those tenants, what if they completely rejected the owner of the land? What if they went ahead and ignored his messenger? What if they even caused harm to the messenger? What even if they killed the messenger? What even if they killed the one who was this guy's son and tried to scheme somehow to take the land for themselves? Now that, that's rather silly. Something like that would not happen. Jesus uses the ludicrous to explain the truth that they were experiencing today. Well, Jesus has some sub-lessons in that. He has some other truths for us to understand, for us to appreciate in what he has to say. And one of the very first ones is the fact that the ownership has not changed hands. Through the whole story, the owner is still the owner. The one who set everything up is still in charge. It is a powerful doctrine for us today. If we're not, eat, if we're not uh, 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 careful, we're going to miss it. We're going to, to relegate it just to one of those stories you're going to learn in Sunday school. But folks, at the foundation of what we believe and what we understand is the doctrine of our Creator. The doctrine that God made everything. The whole book starts with the simple words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's just not some words to start the chapter. Those are foundations for every doctrine to follow. We are here because God decided we would be here. He is creator. He is the one who put everything in place and made everything happen. Sometimes we might miss the fact because we can emphasize and see the, 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 uh, talking about how God did it and miss the reality of this foundational statement, God is the one who did it. This creation, this authority, everything is there because this universe is God's. For without the Creator, this world is chaos. Without the Creator, there's no rhyme or reason 
to who we are, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to be able to do it. Without the Creator, we are truly lost. Without the Creator, we're a cosmic accident. We are just at the whim of whatever physical forces happen to be in play at the time. But the Bible teaches us that we are not ruled by chaos. We are not ruled by happenstance. We are not here by accident. We're here because our loving Father made us. And He made us with a purpose. And He made us with intent. And He made us with understanding and with knowledge. God is that authoritative owner of the universe. Listen to how how, uh, Jesus describes this owner, this one who planted a vineyard. He went ahead and dug a pit. He went ahead and built a tower. He hired the tenants, the sharecroppers, to be able to take care of all that. It was his. Never once did the owner ever give up anything. Never once did the owner say, well, you know what, I've set it all up, I'm just going to go ahead and walk away from it, let it happen the way that it happens. Even the fact that there were tenants there were at his behest. Jesus teaches the lesson of the sharecropper, of the tenant, and lets us know that our heavenly Father is the creator, the maker of all that is. And as he does so, I wonder if he's looking at the Pharisees. Because the immediate lesson for us, the immediate thing that Jesus would teach us, is really about the role of Israel in human history. It, we'll get to some personal application for our lives in just a moment. But right now we understand that Jesus taught in a very specific situation to a very specific audience And he wanted those Pharisees to hear that God was the owner of all that is. He wanted them to understand that God is the one who made. He chose the people. He is the one who put his plan, his desire in place. The owner gets to do that because he's the owner. He is the authority. God is the one that made all of this happen and it's easy for those pharisees for those religious leaders of the day those rulers of jerusalem to talk about their temple to pray their prayers to enjoy their reputation and their status but with just a few words Jesus starts to challenge them by reminding them it is not their temple. It is God's temple. It's not about their prayers. It's the one who is being prayed to. And it's not about their reputation. It's about the reputation of the owner, of the master, of the creator of all that is. Do you feel the discomfort of the Pharisees? Because after all, we talk about our church. We talk about our family. We talk about our job. And Lord, in this economy, some of us talk about our 401k. Oh, Lord, help us all. It's easy for us to think about things. And while it's good for us to talk about our relationship, we must never forget, folks, it is not our church. It is His. It is not about our faith. It's about His grace. It's not about our nation. It's about His people. Oh, it's challenging, and it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. It makes us squirm just a little bit. But folks, if we are going to be true to the lesson that Jesus teaches us, we need to recognize that the owner is still in charge. And the second thing he would tell us, the second thing he would remind us, 
in these next few verses is he paints this picture of the sin that rejects the owner's desire. The sin that rejects the owner's desire. So let me tell you a little parable of my own. One day the husband was asked by the wife, would you mind going to Chick-fil-A? Would you mind picking up a couple of sandwiches, a couple of waffle fries, and a couple of sweet iced teas? Might not be manna from heaven, but it is pretty close. Certainly, says the husband. Glad to. The husband goes to Chick-fil-A, places his order, and in a remarkably quick time, he has the order sitting in the seat beside him, and he makes his way home. When he gets home, the wife opens up the bag to set things out on a plate for their dinner that night. Chick-fil-A has failed somehow to pack the waffle fries. Oh, the waffle fry boxes are there, but mysteriously now they are empty. Just a parable, folks. Just a parable. (laughs) It's easy for us to look out only for our own interests and allow that to move us to places to where we forget where the priority truly lies. You see, the Pharisees had their religion. They had their way of doing things. They had their authority set up and they had their own desire of how things ought to be and everything pointed back so that they would retain their little bit of power in their little patch of planet earth. But Jesus tells a story. A story where those who are merely tenants start acting like the owner's They reject the authority of the owner and the message of the owner. They reject the one that he has sent. They try and set up their own kingdom and their own things exactly the way that they would want. But remember, the very first part of the lesson Jesus has, ownership hasn't changed hands. There is something wrong between the tenants and the owner When the tenants forget who the true owner is, Jesus must have looked at the Pharisees who might have been at the back as Jesus taught this little group. He must have looked at them in the eye and let them know that they are the ones who have forgotten their place. Israel had sinned. Looking back to their days uh, before the, uh, the exile, before the fall, the Old Testament days, when they had a king and they had position and they had some kind of prestige there within their c- country, Israel thought too highly of themselves and they chose their own way to worship who they wanted to worship, how they wanted to worship. They decided what they wanted was more important than what God wanted. And the people of Israel fell. The people of Israel forgot their place. The people of Israel, a chosen people, became a disobedient people. And it was happening all over again in the lives of the Pharisees. We look at those sad examples of the Pharisees. And we see those, the sad example of the tenants beating and killing the messengers of the owner and even his own son. We shake our head. How could they miss it? How could they be so disobedient? How could they be people of such a promise and somehow miss the fact of who was truly in charge? But I wonder how many churches this morning are suffering 
because people have decided that what they want is more important than what God wants. How sad today. To see parents who somehow don't quite understand the responsibility that has been given them in the raising of their children. And it's about what they want and how they want it. Instead of considering the truth of what God desires for those precious little It's a day when we are concerned about my vote and my rights and we have failed to ask the question, God, what do you want for the people of the United States? We can look at the Pharisees and shake our head, but we should be careful Because all too often we look at the Pharisees and we see our own reflection. The owner's still in charge, folks. And here's the last thing Jesus would have us hear. The last thing he wants us to be able to understand. When everything's all said and done, The owner wins. The owner gets his way. The owner does not abdicate. The owner does not give up. The owner does just not walk away and say it's not worth it. The owner takes hold of what is his. That has different application. These Pharisees understood that. They understood that the people of God, somehow this Israel race, these chosen people, somehow had lost who they were. And Jesus is the first to say, there's a new covenant coming. A new covenant that will be formed by the shedding of perfect blood. A new covenant of grace and love and compassion. A covenant not of the binding of the law, but the freedom of mercy. Jesus knew The owner was still in charge. And when all is said and done, God was leading him to this place. His own son. How poignant those words of Jesus are. Knowing that in a few days, the footsteps lead to the cross. And there, perfect blood would be shed. There a new covenant would be made and there a freedom for all eternity to those who trust in His name. Jesus knew that while centuries have been in the making, this was the moment God was working for. God's authority, God's plan, God's desire all coming to fruition that the lost might be saved. The owner is still in charge and the owner is going to win. Oh, we look at that cross and we see defeat. We see pain and horror and agony. But if we could just listen to the words, Jesus looks to the cross But aren't you glad Jesus looked beyond the cross? Jesus looked at that day not of a piece of wood sticking up out of the ground on a hill, but out of a cave, a tomb dug into the side of a hill that one day he would walk out alive proving the victory, proving the perfect plan, proving that God is the one who is in charge. If we choose to fail in our charge, we are the ones who will suffer for it. God's plan will be fulfilled, folks. But oh, might we be the ones who realize our responsibility 
Might we be the ones who realize what is given to us in this great thing called our church family. In the wonderful blessing that is our spouse and our children and our grandchildren. Might we realize this wonderful gift and responsibility that comes with living in this nation we live in today. Might we understand that we are owed nothing, but we owe everything to the power of Christ. Oh, friend, today, I ask you to remember, remember this lesson that Jesus taught. Oh, he taught it that the Pharisees might hear it, the multitudes, even his own disciples. But friends, he taught it for us. He taught it for today, for right now, for we too have been put in a position of accountability. This week, our uh, executive pastor led our devotion in, uh, in staff meeting. Not knowing what the sermon was about, God led him to, to share with us through some understanding of Scripture, it's not about us. That's kind of rude to bring up in staff meeting on a Tuesday morning, if you ask me. Because I don't know about you, but I kind of like to live in a world where it is about me. But God's Word speaks. His truth prevails. And we realize that it's not about us. It's not about the vineyard becoming ours. It's not about the harvest being our prosperity. We are not here to be served, but we are here to serve, folks. All too often, listen to this, all too often, we think the church is like a cruise ship. You know, you get to come in and somebody's there. Cruises are fun things. The moment you walk on that, onto that, that, that gangplank and walk in, man, everything is about you, isn't it? Everything's about your comfort and, and your desire. They, they take care of you and they treat you and it's so relaxing and so wonderful. I propose to you, the church ain't nothing like a cruise ship. It's a battleship, folks. We are on this journey not to be pampered. We're on this journey to stand firm in the armor of God. We are chosen to be able to be here that we might be used by Him to take His gospel into a world that's going to die and go to hell unless they accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Folks, we have the charge. It's true of our church, it's true of our families. It's true of our employment. It's true of our nation. It's true of every area of life we are in. We are here to serve Him. Might we be found faithful when the Master comes calling. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Lord, this day, This moment, Lord, Lord, we realize you are the owner. You are the one in charge. Nothing is ever going to change that, Lord. Lord, if there are attitudes, if there is sin, if there is rebellion, Lord, might today be those hearts changed. Lord, today might we come to you and seek you. Lord, might daddies 
understand their families. It's things that you have given them. And might they serve responsibly, Lord, as you would want. Might mamas be able to understand your calling on their lives. The great, great gift that has been given for your kingdom. In your work. Lord, by every church member here, know what a privilege and joy it is to be part of this congregation. And Father, might we surrender to what you want and not what we want. Lord, there are days it's hard to be a citizen of this country. There are days when it hurts. Days when we see the shameful. We see the sin. We see the pride and the arrogance. And it's hard. But Father, you never called us to easy. You called us to be your ambassadors wherever we might be. So Lord, might we take up the challenge. Lord, who bring your light to a dark world. Father, I pray for the one that's here today that has never accepted you as Savior, the one who's never received your promise and your hope. Lord, today you are calling them. You're bringing them home, Lord. Today might they say yes. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Guard us now, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, thank you. I am so glad you were able to be part of our worship service today. And, you know, my prayer every week is that the Lord would speak. It's not about me. It's not about my opinions or my commentary. It is all about what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say to you, the thing that he has for your heart and the direction he has for your life. And I pray today that he has spoken to you. And maybe there's a time sometimes when that that speaking implies a direction. Maybe you need to consider some decisions. Maybe there's something the Lord is saying, not just to think about, but something to take action on. And this is your time. The phone number is there on the screen. You can call the church office. One of our deacons is there ready to go ahead and take your call. Maybe it's a day to accept Jesus as your Savior. You've had some questions about that. But you know, when all is said and done, this is the day of salvation for you. Would you call us? Maybe there's a need in your life for, for a prayer. Maybe there's a question about church membership. Maybe there's something else that the, the Lord is dealing with in, in your life. And you just want to be able to have another human being pray with you over the thing that is before you. Give us a call. Let us know. You can also email us if you'd like. But the bottom line is that this is your time. Not just a time just to watch a worship service, but I pray that today has been a day when you've been able to participate in the worship service and the Lord has been able to speak to you. May God bless you and again, thank you for being part of what the Lord is doing in our church today. Let's have a word of prayer. So Lord, thank you for your work. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that moves and Lord, for the fact that you have a will and a plan for our lives. Continue, Lord, to lead us and guide us this day. For it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.